The Navy is studying a mammal that once walked on land and now lives in the sea. This is Noddy, a three-year-old Pacific porpoise, seven feet long, weighing 200 pounds. She's the guinea pig for a research project that could lead to a revolution in underwater weapons, sounds detection, and anti-submarine warfare, part of a much bigger program conducted by the Naval Ordnance Test Station at China Lake. Sir, we're air to air and air to ground. I mean, how come we're thinking about building a submarine? And they said, well, Dr. McLean has this idea for an underwater fighter plane. And now, from submarines to satellites. China Lake's involvement with submarine vehicles began for entirely practical purposes, to support its torpedo development and testing programs centered at the Knott's Pasadena Annex. During the early 1960s, an unlikely accretion of canisters, cables, and claws was designed to retrieve experimental items from the ocean floor. That first not submersible, called Curve, for cable-controlled underwater recovery vehicle, did quiet duty beneath the station's sea ranges until it hit the world stage in 1966 when it was used to recover a nuclear weapon lost in deep water off the coast of Spain. Entirely aside from the torpedoes, ballistic missiles, and other submarine-launched weapons that the station was developing and supporting, along with its super-secret programs in submarine detection, communication, and air defense, China Lake maintained a broad-based program of research and experimentation in sciences and applications related to every facet of Navy operations and interest, including those beneath the surface of the sea. By the mid-1960s, Knotts was studying everything from how fish swim to the nature of the sea itself. Research covered bioluminescence, advanced propulsion, shark repellents, glass sphere pressure structures, and boundary layer control. The station was supporting sea lab operations and designing Rocksite, a research base on the sea floor. And Knotts scientists were talking to dolphins. Knotts borrowed the Sukou, Jacques Cousteau's famous diving saucer, for some research work during 1964, and China Lake began designing and building its own submarine research vessels. Deep Jeep, DRV, Deep View, Hikino, and Moray. Conceived as a sort of undersea fighter plane, the Moray research prototype was built in Mike Lab machine shop and tested in the Snort Reservoir before going to sea for proof dives. Moray brought together much of the station's research and experimental work in submarine power, propulsion, and weapon systems. Most of China Lake's oceanographic studies and submarine development efforts went to other activities with the 1967 separation of the Pasadena Annex and the creation of the so-called centers of excellence with their more narrowly defined missions. But China Lake, as the Naval Weapons Center, did not withdraw entirely from the undersea realm. The center continued work on highly classified projects in special weapons, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and special warfare, weapons and submersibles for SEALs and covert operations. But that's another story. signal from the depths of the sea, the voice of a piece of hardware lost on the bottom and continuously transmitting its acoustical mayday to a world 1,748 feet above. The hardware is a prototype torpedo undergoing development for the United States Navy. When experimental ordnance remains unaccountably on the bottom after a test, it must be retrieved 
since the recorded data stored within is essential to determining why the test was successful or unsuccessful. Also, it can serve again as a test vehicle. Curve was developed by the Naval Ordnance Test Station, Pasadena, California, and its primary function is search and recovery for deep submergence operations to 2,000 feet. A secondary function is to provide an economical, flexible, and durable means for prolonged undersea research. A surface recovery craft has dropped a marker to indicate the approximate location of the torpedo. Surface recovery boats also aid the larger vessel in maintaining the best position above the undersea target throughout the deep recovery operation. Critical motor down. The propulsion units are powered by 440 volt, 60 cycle, 10 horsepower motors, Port, motor which are controlled by three phase variacs. The marine type motors have been encased in oil filled, pressure compensated Starboard housings ahead. to provide a silt free environment. Starboard motor stern. All right, TV left. TV left, TV right, TV right. The hydraulic system that operates the tilt of the sonar, the pan and tilt of the TV and photographic equipment, and Curve's versatile claw is a pressure compensated system that provides a 750 PSI working pressure at all depths. Claw left, claw open and close. Claw open, claw close. Curve's claw can be replaced by a grapnel device, a snare, or a clamshell. Control of curve is accomplished from the console. That looks pretty good. Give me some power, we'll tilt the sonar. Curve's operators can listen with curve sonar ears and see with curve's television eyes. Sonar up. Curve's operators remain safe on the surface of the sea, while Curve is sent into the depths, where it can be maneuvered and made to perform intricate and difficult tasks that are often beyond the capability and endurance of a man submersible. The combined action of the 10 to 15 pounds of positive buoyancy and the action of the vertical screw create an updraft in the water when hovering close to the bottom, thus minimizing water disturbances that would interfere with camera and television coverage. Each of the three motors can develop a forward thrust of 400 pounds and a reverse thrust of 200 pounds. The speed with which curve descends in the water is determined by the time it takes the crew to handle the cable. It has been found that the average time for a 1400 foot descent is 20 minutes. Okay, now open your claw. In order to attach the claw, curve must be at an approximate right angle to the hardware. Therefore, curve is maneuvered to make a broadside approach while still some distance away, so that visibility near the target will not be hampered by circulating silt and mud. Looks like a good approach here. All right, TV, just a little more right and a little down. Good. Good, you've got the claw on it, now close. Curve has extended man's hand deep into the sea, provided it with intelligent direction and Herculean strength. Curve is able to recover hardware weighing about 200 pounds in water, using only the power of its propulsion units. Loads to 500 pounds have been brought to the surface from relatively shallow depths by manually hauling in the cable. 
ejection of the claw and a marker buoy enables surface recovery of heavier loads. Curves work is not limited to the recovery of torpedoes. In March 1966, Curve was flown to Palomar, Spain to help recover an item lost in the sea and valued somewhat in excess of $75,000. Since January 17th, following a mid-air collision between an H-bomb laden B-52 and a jet tanker, La Bamba had been resisting all efforts for its recovery from the ocean depths. Found at a depth of 2,500 feet by the tiny manned submersible Alvin and lost during a recovery attempt, the bomb had been relocated by Alvin 2,850 feet from the surface, almost 1,000 feet deeper than Curve's operational depth, a maximum 2,000 feet. Curve joined the recovery team and with a specially designed grapnel to replace its claw, descended into the murky depths. Stills photographed from Curve show the bomb's parachute and the grapnel as it was inserted into the apex or spill portion of the parachute. Twice, Curve descended to the sea floor and entangled a grapnel in the shroud lines. Then Curve itself became entangled in the parachute and was raised with the bomb, photographed here when approximately 100 feet from the surface. Freed from time-limiting and other hazardous factors inherent in the manned submersible, Curve proved beyond any doubt that the remote-controlled submersible system has a place in man's future within the sea. Not as a device in competition with other devices, but as a useful member of a team in mutual support of one another. In mid-March 1963, the underwater research platform Moray TV-1A underwent the first in a series of manned environmental system tests at the U.S. Naval Ordnance Test Station, China Lake, California. The test site, which had previously been used for similar unmanned tests, was a reservoir for the water break system of the supersonic Naval Ordnance Research Track, nicknamed Snort. The water volume is approximately 180 feet long, 80 feet wide, and 12 feet deep. Secondary test objectives were to check out the several Moray subsystems completely submerged, determine net buoyancy, and locate the center of gravity with respect to the center of buoyancy. Communication between the two-man crew and shore-based test personnel was provided by UQC underwater telephone, FM, FM radio, and hardwire sound-powered telephone. Dynamometer disks to simulate operational propulsion system loading replaced conventional counter-rotating propellers. Prior to immersion, Moray's flooding switches and communication and environmental systems were thoroughly checked. To minimize lifting loads, the vehicle was hoisted using a spreader bar and sling system. The color coding facilitates diver identification when the vehicle is submerged. Critical areas such as hatch covers and lifting points are painted to contrast strongly with the rest of the vehicle. 
The first test was conducted on the afternoon of Monday, March 18th, with no personnel aboard. As Moray entered the water, the volume within the hull, except for those components requiring isolation from water environment, was free flooded, a basic design feature. Prior to the actual test operation, divers inspected the vehicle for bubbles, which would indicate leaks in normally dry compartments. The objectives of the first day's testing were limited to determining the vehicle's net buoyancy and to locating the center of gravity with respect to the center of buoyancy. On Tuesday morning, March 19th, the first man test was conducted. The crew consisted of two project members who had been specially trained for participation in this test. The objectives of this phase of the test were to check out the environmental system, propulsion system, sonar system, and television equipment. Divers attached baskets to the bottom of the hull into which was placed lead shot to make Moray negatively buoyant. Moray submerged at 11.50 a.m. and remained underwater until 3.30 p.m., a total of three hours and 40 minutes. Moray's life support equipment performed more efficiently when the vehicle was completely submerged than during previous dry environment tests at Michelson Laboratory. The results indicate that the internal heat load of 4,000 BTUs per hour was dissipated as calculated through the aluminum sphere when underwater. The propulsion system checkout consisted primarily of observing performance of the switching equipment and inspecting for shaft seal leakage. The switching equipment functioned satisfactorily and shaft seal leakage was well within design tolerances. On Wednesday, March 20th, two man tests and one unmanned test were conducted. During the first manned test, Moray was submerged for an hour and 39 minutes. Compass swing and systems interference were checked during this mission. The vehicle was spun through a 360 degree arc to check the compass null point. Then it was rotated through 90 degree increments to check bearing alignment with shore-based transits. The results of this test indicated that being surrounded by water had no appreciable effect on the compass system. In the afternoon of March 20th, the final unmanned test was performed. The weights were removed from Moray's hull and she was replaced in the basin and released from the hoisting sling. In this completely free state, the vehicle was given an informal check for handling ease. Moray was shoved about the basin with long poles which had been equipped with suction grips. Despite the instability of the temporary pier, Moray's positive buoyancy made her easily manageable by external forces when almost fully submerged. Moray could also be readily moved about by a diver. The final man test checked operation of the mercury transfer system, which maintains the vehicle's attitude. Prior to submersion, the propulsion system was operated for two minutes. The mercury system itself performed satisfactorily, proving out system design. All test objectives were met. The environmental system was proved completely successful after approximately six and one quarter hours of submerged operation with a two-man crew. The propulsion switching system met design requirements, as did the mercury transfer system, despite a single defective component. The electronics posed no problems except those anticipated as a result of testing in the small volume of the snort reservoir.
A brief study conducted by the Naval Ordnance Test Station in August 1961 proves that it is possible to teach the dolphin to respond to voice commands. The study had a threefold purpose. First, to develop techniques of voice communication with a dolphin. Secondly, to determine whether or not standard educational techniques are effective in dolphin training. And thirdly, to obtain an evaluation of the dolphin's intelligence relative to children. The man selected to conduct the tests has 12 years teaching experience Ball. with elementary students. Ball. Ball. The communication ball. centered around an object vocabulary. In this case, a ball, a Hand. ring, and a hat were introduced Hand. by name Hand. and by direct association to Lana, one of Pacific Hand. Ocean Park's show Hand. animals. Hat. Get the ring. Ring. Then, by means of an underwater speaker, the animal was commanded to retrieve each object. This demonstration is the result of five training periods averaging 30 minutes in length. Ball, 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 ball. Get the ball. Ball. At the end of the fifth training session, data showed that Lana's correct response average was 60%. This average is composed of periods of high reliability and of periods of low reliability, much like that of a child. Her near-perfect response during the favorable periods proves that she understands the voice command and gives good indication that the vocabulary could be expanded. Another animal used in the study was Noddy, a Pacific white-sided dolphin owned by Knott's and housed at Marineland. This demonstration was photographed at the end of seven training Hat. sessions, averaging Hat. 20 minutes in length. Hat. Two of the four Hat. words learned by Noddy Hat. are being reviewed. Get the ball. Ball. Heading for the nearest object, then proceeding on to the correct one, was typical of both Lana and Noddy. The fact that both animals, upon hearing the command repeated, retrieved the object requested, further verifies the possibility of teaching them a more extensive vocabulary. Hat, 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 hat. Noddy's correct response average for the seven training sessions was 70%. As in the case of Lana, this average is composed of periods of high and low reliability, with sufficient periods of high reliability con to conclude that she understands the spoken command. Come on. Ring, 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 ring. The word ring identifies to Nadi both a familiar and favorite object. Previous extensive training required Nadi to wear such a ring for long periods of time. Therefore, it was necessary for her during this study not only to learn the word for the object, but to learn not to wear it. All right, come. Stick, 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 stick. With the hat, ring, ball, and stick in the water, the command was given to retrieve the hat. With the stick, stick. This time, Naughty could not resist first donning the ring. Ball, ball. That's it. To summarize this brief study, it was Get found the first that there ball. were sufficient periods of near-perfect response with both Lana and Noddy to conclude that the dolphin can be taught to respond to voice commands. Secondly, that similarities to children in personality and in periods of attentiveness and playfulness Stick. indicate the educational Stick. methods used in teaching a child are effective in training the dolphin. And finally, that the learning rate of the two particular dolphins used appears to be equivalent to that of a normal six to eight year old child. A more thorough investigation must be made, however, to verify this preliminary evaluation of the dolphin's learning rate.
the time is December 1964. The place, 1,000 feet beneath the surface of the sea off San Clemente Island. The sea is no longer a fence impregnable, for man's control is now pressing beyond the shore and into the very depths of the dark blue ocean. must develop the tools and techniques man will need to live and work in the deep ocean environment. One tool is the submersible, the forerunner of which is Captain Jacques Cousteau's suku, or diving saucer, called Denise. The suku, by arrangement with the Westinghouse Corporation, was one of four submersibles to participate in a two-week diving operation conducted by right. the U.S. Okay. Naval Ordnance Test Station. The three other submersibles involved in the diving operation were designed and developed by the Naval Ordnance Test Station. These included a two-man research vehicle called Deep Jeep, a small two-man test vehicle designated Moray, and Curve, a surface-controlled research and recovery system. At the diving site were two support craft and the Knott's underwater operations vessel YFU-53 control center for the submersible operation. The YFU-53 is an outgrowth of the Naval Ordnance Test Station's anti-submarine weapons development work. Its prime functions are deep ocean recovery and various types of deep ocean engineering. It is an extensively instrumented work platform equipped, as this model shows, with a frame which can be lowered to depths to 6,000 feet. Specialized instrumentation mounted on the frame include television cameras, still and motion picture cameras, lights, a high-resolution scanning sonar, and a lariat, or snare. The snare is used to recover ordnance lost on the ocean floor. Here, at the control console, is the frame operator monitoring the recovery on a television screen. This vessel, with its vast array of specialized equipment and instrumentation, enables knots to perform an unusual amount of useful work on the deep ocean floor. For the submersible operation, the deep operating frame was specially rigged with a mock-up of a submarine hatch bale, a simulated submarine hatch, a spear, and a dummy torpedo. The frame was then lowered to the ocean floor 1,000 feet beneath the control vessel. It was now to serve as a test platform for the manned submersibles, Sukup, and Deep Jeep. As these preparations proceeded, Approximately 300 yards away, launch preparations were underway aboard the Birch Tide, the support vessel for the French diving saucer. Piloting the Sukup was Dr. André Lebon, director of Captain Cousteau's scientific organization. His companion is Captain George Bond, medical officer in charge of Sea Lab, another of this country's Man in the Sea projects. The second crew member of the Sukup usually was a knots man who acted as observer for the pilot. Man descending into the sea to explore and perform useful work requires a submersible capable of mobility and precise maneuvers. Suku, designed specifically for undersea exploration and for only limited bottom sampling, provided useful information on underwater control when it attempted tasks demanding more complex maneuvers. In this dive, it was intended that the Suku would demonstrate the manned submersible's ability to locate an object on the ocean floor and perform a recovery, even though the vehicle itself cannot lift a heavy object. To fulfill this assignment, the submersible was equipped with a knots-designed inflatable recovery device. It consists of a clamp, a gas generator, and an inflatable bag. The object that the Sukup was to locate and recover was a dummy torpedo equipped with both a 9 and a 45 KC pinger. The suku, equipped with a pinger receiver, descended to the sea floor and slowly rotated, 
to acoustically locate the torpedo. Roger, As the submersible moved away, a cable attached to the vehicle's mechanical claw triggered an explosive valve releasing hydrazine into a reactor chamber, which generates the gas that inflates the bag. The torpedo, weighing 200 pounds, was lifted to the surface in approximately 10 minutes. During the two weeks of diving, the Sukhup usually was placed in the water first. Following its lift out, the not submersible deep jeep then would be sent to the bottom. Deep Jeep is a two-man research vehicle capable of depths to 2,000 feet. Basically, it is a five-foot steel sphere with a battery pack at its bottom and a syntactic foam float at its top. Weights held on by electromagnets encircle the bottom of the vehicle and are used for ballast variation. The chemicals used in Deep Jeep's air purification system provide the vehicle an operating time of four to six hours and up to 60 hours in an emergency. Unlike the Sukup, whose passengers recline, the Deep Jeep operators sit upright. Deck. Okay, Deep Chief. Complete your checkoff list before you waterboard. Power on. Instruments working satisfactory. Environmental system working satisfactory. Deep Jeep is designed as a work and research vehicle. Its potential uses include performance of manned work in deep water, geological and topographical surveys of the sea floor, and investigations of ocean phenomena such as the deep scattering layer, which acts as a false bottom for sonar signals. Deep Jeep was to move several hundred yards away from the control vessel, then locate and home in on an acoustic pinger mounted on the frame. Communication with the surface ship is achieved with an ultrasonic telephone system, which provides reliable communication at distances up to 2,000 yards. Two motors, located one on each side of the vehicle, can pivot simultaneously or separately about the vehicle's lateral axis. The submersible is maneuvered by altering the speed of these motors and the angle of each propeller. In fact, Deep Jeep's flight through liquid space is much like that of a helicopter. Despite the fact the control systems of both the Sukup and Deep Jeep are considered to be somewhat primitive, the vehicles were found to be capable of the hovering and settling maneuvers required for submarine rescue work and for deep recovery operations. Ideally, man would like to do on the seafloor what he does on land, tarry in some selected locale, or move rapidly to some distant area of interest. Submersibles like Deep Jeep and Sukup will enable man to familiarize himself with a particular area, while submersibles like Moray will provide him a long-range exploration capability. The concept of a small two-man submarine is not new, but the approach Knotts took when designing the torpedo-shaped moray is. Instead of scaling down a submarine, Knotts applied the principles of torpedo design. Moray is a positively buoyant 33-foot-long vehicle with a body diameter of 64 inches. It was developed for use as a test platform for evaluating underwater techniques and devices such as sonar, underwater television cameras, navigation systems, and power supplies. Right, 
Encased within Moray's free-floating fiberglass hull are two five-foot pressure-resistant spheres. One houses electronic gear, the other a crew of two. There are no viewing ports in the submersible. Instead, a high-resolution short-range sonar is used to detect and localize underwater objects. For positive close-range classification, a two-camera television system is used. One camera provides visibility at the surface through a forward viewing periscope. The other is a bottom viewing camera. A dead reckoning navigation system provides continually updated information on the vehicle's position. The life support system was designed originally for the Mercury project. The system, modified to meet the requirements of an inner rather than an outer space capsule, provides Moray an operational endurance of 24 hours. A unique development area of the Moray program has been in buoyant materials. Within the Moray hull is a syntactic foam having a density of 41 pounds per cubic foot and a compressibility close to that of seawater. This material provides positive buoyancy to depths to 6,000 feet. Moray presently is propelled by a battery-operated torpedo motor that drives counter-rotating propellers. The vehicle's surface speed is six knots. Underwater, Moray is capable of speeds to 16 knots. Its depth capability is 6,000 feet. The fourth submersible to enter the sea during the two-week diving operation was the knots developed unmanned, cable-controlled underwater research vehicle called Curve. The sea is too vast and too deep a frontier to challenge with one system only. Both civilian and military operations within the aquatic environment will require vehicles capable of entering the ocean in all kinds of weather. Curve is such a vehicle. Powered and controlled from the surface, it effectively extends man's eyes, ears, and hands into the depths of the sea. An outstanding advantage of Curve is its ability to remain continuously operative and underwater for extended periods. Curve's control cable is kept neutrally buoyant by stainless steel floats. Horizontal movements of the vehicle are controlled by port and starboard propellers. A vertical propeller controls dive and ascent. Curve's primary function is search and recovery for deep submergence operations to 2,000 feet. A secondary function is collection of data on bottom conditions. A console aboard the support vessel is the center of activity during all curve operations. Through the use of a depthometer and altimeter, the vehicle is brought close to the bottom. In this dive, curve was to demonstrate the search and recovery capabilities of an unmanned submersible. The object it was to locate was the dummy torpedo. At this stage of the search, Sonar provides the primary means for locating the torpedo. Curve is equipped with both an active and passive sonar system, a television camera, lights, and a camera for documentation. The curve operator holds curve on course until the torpedo is visible and classified on a television monitor. When Curve's hydraulic claw has been securely locked on, both the vehicle and the recovered object can be brought to the surface, or the claw can be ejected and a hardware retrieving buoy released. In this case, the claw was disengaged from the torpedo. For Curve, an extension of man, and Sukup, representing man himself, 
now we're to attempt a rendezvous in the sunless sea depths. A cooperative operation involving two such vehicles is unique in itself. But it becomes even more significant when one remembers that lying at the bottom of the sea is more than 71% of this planet's land. Land for man to explore, to work, and make productive. According to the biblical chapter Genesis, man's heritage is the sea. But to claim the riches of this great cornucopia and wrest from its depths any threat to his nation's security, man must develop a technology oriented entirely to the world of liquid space beneath its surface. Suku, Deep Jeep, Moray, and Curve are but first experimental steps in this challenging effort. <laughs> 